So hello everyone, my name is Jim Corporal and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Can We Navigate It? Digital Accessibility Fundamentals for Websites, Documents and Videos. We have a great group of experts here to discuss this important topic today and we're all very excited to be here. Before I get started, I just want to go over some housekeeping notes. Next slide, please. Most of you are joining us through the WebEx platform and are hearing the audio through your computers. The audio is also available over a phone line for those of you who would like to listen to today's event in that way. The conference call phone number is on the screen, 1-415-655-0045. And the access code is 406-265-051 and then the pound symbol. You'll have an opportunity to submit questions in the chat window. We are live captioning this webinar, which you can follow along within the captioning window at the bottom of your screen. You must open the window titled Media Viewer to display the captioning. I'll give you a couple seconds to find that in your WebEx session. We also ask that you kindly complete a brief survey, the link from which will be displayed in the chat window. This webinar is also being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email within the next week or so with details on how to access the archived event. So hopefully everyone is connected, you can hear us okay. All your windows and captioning are available to you. Uh, any questions, uh, submit through the, the Q&A panel and we'll try to address them as we go through the webinar today. Next slide, please. Again, my name is Jim Corporal and I'm the account executive for the Viscardi Center. I work with all our partners and clients to make sure that they understand what document accessibility is, why it's important, and how we do it. Then I ensure that we execute on all projects for all our customers and clients. We also have Matt Treiner, the Chief Product Officer for User First, who has over a decade of experience in developing and scaling technology solutions. User First is an innovative automated web accessibility service provider that works with global organizations to ensure their web assets are accessible for users with disabilities. It's a pleasure to have you here today, Matt. Finally, we have Jeff Andrews from Alternative Communication Services, or ACS. Jeff is a sales and marketing executive with over seven years of industry experience. ACS is a network of companies that provides video captioning services, audio description, and CART, which we'll get into in a bit. And Jeff, thank you also for being here. Next slide, please. Now, before getting started, we'd like to answer, have you answer one quick question, please. This is being asked to provide a sort of baseline of participants' knowledge and comfort level with our topic today. Please note that your responses are uh, anonymous and answering the question honestly is essential to helping us understand your needs and our effectiveness. So please take a quick moment to answer it. The question should be appearing on the right-hand side of your screen. That question is, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your understanding of digital accessibility? Please use a scale one equal very little understanding and five equals extensive understanding. So I'll give you a few seconds to fill out that survey and we appreciate that. You know, I'm waiting for those answers to pop up. Okay, there we go. Looks like we're about uh, in the mid-range there, uh, about a three, 64% of our attendees. So hopefully we can uh, get that number up by the end of today's webinar. And we're actually going to ask the same question uh, at the end of our session today. So. Um, hopefully we'll provide some, some information. We'll get that number up in terms of your, your understanding. So um, thanks for doing that today. Um, with that said, I'll hand it off to our first presenter today, Mr. Matt Triner from User First. Matt, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, so uh, you can go ahead into our first slide. 
Um, so just as a brief introduction for user first, um, and, and this will be the only slide I read any part of everything else I kind of, uh, I'm just going to talk through and, and kind of expect everybody else to kind of read the details. Um, user first is a team solely focused on digital accessibility innovation. And the reason we point that out is many people in the web accessibility space do other things. Many testing tools are also SEO tools. Many consultancies that provide accessibility services are also providing UX design, uh, web development, and other generic services. Um, we think those companies are wonderful. We partner with them all the time. Um, they're, they're really great and they're numerous. We are one of the fewer companies that are solely and completely focused on digital accessibility. So every person in our team is in some way an accessibility expert in their own right, be it in program management, be it in marketing or in software development, like as in uh, my background. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So uh, the whole purpose of my discussion here is to kind of get the audience uh, understanding the very basic hot topics of web accessibility. Um, there's a lot more to it that we're not going to cover in, in this particular uh, forum. Uh, I encourage uh, everybody to do their own research on this topic. Feel free to come by user first site or, or some of the free materials we make available online to kind of educate yourself at a technical level. Um, but at the highest of levels, the, the, the mission of web accessibility, according to the World Wide Web Consortium, which are the people that define web accessibility standards, is that websites, tools, and technologies will be designed and developed so that people can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with at the aforementioned website, as well as be able to contribute to that website. So those are two very different things. They basically want to say that a person can interact, buy services, leverage, be every bit as involved as a seeing or, or otherwise abled user. But they also have a very specific requirement that persons with disabilities and that everybody um, is able to contribute to that site. So be that through normal contribution mechanisms, be that through authoring tools, um, or be that through basic things like commenting, tickets, and posting. So there is a lot of ways that that means W3C is, is purposefully vague on this topic because they want to be as broad as possible to include as many types of websites and types of digital assets and types of people that can use them. So if it seems like it's a broad thing and, and a very daunting task, that's because it is and that's intentional. Inclusion can be difficult. Next slide, please. Web accessibility encompasses all disabilities that affect access to the web. So what you see here is a list of that higher level, uh, sorry, contribute to the web is actually a typo there, I apologize, but all of these are high level disability categories of which every single one of these categories has a spectrum and anything on the spectrum of these different categories as defined by W3C can impact your use of the web. Um, some of these are, are more obvious. Auditory uh, impacts your ability to hear things like the presentation that we are on right now, which is why we provide captioning. Um, <clears throat> uh, auditory, uh, uh, excuse me, auditory requires captioning on videos and, and other um, uh, uh, canned content, not like live content like we're dealing with here. Um, cognitive uh, disabilities uh, require people to have additional help possibly to use simplified uh, language. Uh, I was going to say simplified English, but this is an international standard. They really want you to be simplified in the language that the audience of the page is intended for. Um, neurological can deal with anything from mobility, such as the ability to use a fine-grained device like a mouse, um, or the ability to uh, use even more uh, mundane objects like a keyboard. Um, speech and visual and, and the other, again, we could go through these in any different levels of specifics, but the idea is, is that all of these disabilities will impact what is considered to be a normal pattern of access and therefore need to be considered when designing a website with accessibility focus. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? We've talked about it in terms of disability, but what does this mean in terms of population and population health? And, and from a business perspective, what does this mean in impact to a business that, that needs to comply with these rules? So uh, according to uh, uh, various statistics, and we've compiled them from different places, including the World Health Organization, NIH, the Census Bureau, um, but the most common answer is in the United, or in the world rather, there are 1.5, 
or 1.5 billion people, one in five people are estimated to live with a disability. Um, the assumption according to the World Health Organization is that that creates a combined disposable income of over $1.2 trillion. Um, this is actually the largest single minority group in the United States. Um, when it when looked at people that are considered a protected class or, or otherwise a disadvantaged group, um, <clears throat> though uh, the, the people that consider themselves disabled most often are not people that you would actually think about. That would be, um, and I use this as an opportunity to, to make fun of my dad in, in all presentations, but if you look at the size of the text on his iPhone, my dad would never identify himself in conversation and government paperwork as disabled, but he is absolutely on the visual impairment spectrum. And that absolutely affects websites and affects people's use of websites and technologies, because I can't tell you how many times my dad came to me to say, why won't this website zoom? Or why can't I make any sense of this page? And that's people that would fall into the aging and elderly category and temporary injury people that have ended up in a situation where they can't use an arm, can't use a leg, can't see for a period of time. These are again, people that are completely lost by the standard social approaches and safety net that are given to people with disabilities because these are largely people that don't identify with that community in a traditional sense, but all of whom can benefit from web accessibility. So the, uh, uh, the kind of conclusion here is the internet was kind of designed and built with an abundance of ableism. Um, there really wasn't a lot of thought in the initial architecture of the internet, and there is little um, attention paid to accessibility outside of places that are either regulated or places that have a social mission that would cause them to look at disadvantaged populations holistically, where disability uh, would be one of them. Uh, next slide, please. And to get a little bit technical here, uh, I, I promised I wouldn't get very technical, but, but to get a little bit technical here, the reason why this happens isn't necessarily nefarious, right? It isn't because people specifically don't care about people with disabilities. It isn't because developers are heartless people. It's because one, accessibility is not taught in schools. Um, I'm a software engineer and I never learned accessibility until I worked with the US government and, and other places that had mandated requirements. And even in the places that had it mandated, an accessibility expert comes in at the end. So if you look at this kind of solution development lifecycle graphic we have here, after requirements, design, development, after everything is done, is usually the first time anybody does an accessibility audit. And if anybody on the call today is thinking of themselves in the audience and how they're doing things, it's probably something that looks familiar. It's very common. This is not an uncommon approach. And the problem with this approach is at the very end, you get your audit. And then your question always becomes, well, do I have enough time, money, you know, effort, et cetera, to actually go and fix these problems? And most people will fix some of them and not others. They will do the best that they can or they'll do with the resources they have, or they'll do the best they can with the time that they have. But, but at the end of the day, there is a set of escaping defects that are just simply never prioritized. And these issues that are never prioritized become latent problems for people with disabilities that become huge and become very difficult. Next slide, please. And, and a very common response I get when educating people is, well, I'm not in, I'm not in uh, education and I'm not in telco and I'm not in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I'm not in uh, government. So this doesn't apply to me. And this is a complicated question. Um, there is no mention of the internet in the ADA, period. It's not mentioned in there. Anybody that says otherwise hasn't read the ADA. That said, there is a lot of implied requirements under the ADA and court cases like Domino's, which prove, uh, which have had been held up time and time again, show that the right to use of the internet lives within the passages of the ADA, specifically the use of public accommodations. So more nuanced arguments is to say, well, if I don't have a physical presence, then why does my online presence count? Because if I'm not a store, how could the ADA apply to me? You need to look at um, various uh, suits like 
um, uh, Bank of America's, Domino's, Winn-Dixie, and you could actually see that there's, there's a strong tie and there's actually currently a circuit split where depending on where you are in the US depends on that nexus between physical and digital accommodations. All of this by way of saying, we're watching these laws get written, we're watching the regulatory process unfold, and an abundance of caution needs to be taken for sites that are concerned about this issue and know that they haven't worked towards accessibility. Because so far, um, the opinions of courts and the opinions of, of, of legal professionals has been that this applies to everybody. And, and that's uh, a, a difficult thing to wrestle with from an implementation perspective. Next slide, please. Another good example is uh, Price versus Everglades, where a Florida court uh, basically ruled that a, uh, a website um, that, that has a brick and mortar business um, has to uh, have an associated website. So this is where I talked about that nexus before and how um, there's kind of a linkage between physical and digital properties. And this was actually one of the first uh, uh, examples of that case where that nexus was upheld. Um, people have also, I'm sure people have also mentioned that DOJ has not created regulations in this area. Um, that's true. DOJ has not created regulatory cover for people, which people have been asking for for a while. And I think the reason, in my opinion, is because DOJ knows that as soon as they pass a regulation, the Congressional Budget Office will score it, and the cost of what it will cost businesses to implement this is high. And so they don't want to be the, the people responsible for putting a tax on business. And at the same time, they're going to stand behind the courts that are saying everybody must do this. So basically, DOJ is ducking this issue until such a time as they're hoping the world starts to move towards accessibility. And then the cost to doing this as people start to get educated, people start to remediate their sites, people start to engage with experts, the public cost will be lower. This is actually very similar to how they dealt with ATMs and other accessibility issues over the years while they're trying to wait for industry to catch up. However, the scale of the internet is so huge, that's gonna be a while. Next slide, please. There is good news here for businesses, however, which is to say, if one in five adults in America have a, a, a identify as having a disability, there is a huge untapped market in those customers and their ability to use your assets and your properties. Enhancing your website for disabilities is actually more cost effective and timely than a lot of traditional ADA compliance. I think of all of the stores in Manhattan that are in old buildings that cannot possibly bear the construction cost for the proper ramps. And the cost of having a digital experience to allow people to use this from the safety of their home is, is much less expensive and probably more impactful from the actual customer standpoint. Um, as we become more educated as a society, and this is the generational shift that user first really pushes, we expect people to be looking at accessibility from the start. We expect people to be looking at uh, accessibility in their designs and in their requirements. And by the way, saying you shall be accessible is not a requirement. I mean, it is a requirement, but it's not a useful requirement. And so we mean that designers, when they're explaining how to design an experience, they should be specifying that a keyboard should be usable for every element. Designers should stop inventing new colors. We have a, a, a woman in our office who is visually impaired, and one of the biggest tips she'll give people is to say, stop inventing new words for gray and brown. Just tell me that it's gray or brown. I don't know what these colors that you're describing are. And so the, the, the websites that have taken the time to do this become her favorite websites. And people with disabilities are some of the most loyal consumers in the market, according to various studies from the USBLN, from uh, 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 Census, and from uh, other disability support groups. So there is a, an upside for businesses for doing this, and being the first to do it means you get to capture that market of loyal customers. So we try to tell everybody that in addition to this being the law, and in addition to this being the right thing to do, there is a good capitalist reason to be doing this as a business. Next slide, please. So a couple times today, we've talked about web accessibility and W3C. Um, web accessibility actually refers to the web content accessibility guidelines or what we refer to as WCAG. Um, the WCAG standards 
are basically a standard that describe how to develop web content for accessibility. So what does that mean? It explains how to test it. It explains automated and, and manual tests. It actually walks through the checkpoints of what to look for and how to fix it. It explains coding practices. It explains best standards. Um, it explains how to fix and remediate issues that are on your page. And it is a, a kind of a guidebook that all of your, uh, any vendor that you talk to or any web development team that you talk to should be very familiar with if you're expecting them to code your website accessibly. Um, we actually have a couple of sample questions that, that we recommend that uh, you ask your either existing coding teams or your accessibility experts, which is to say, how are you testing screen readers? Um, uh, and the reason I ask that is because most people aren't even aware that there are half a dozen screen readers on the market that are popular. There's actually close to 60 screen readers total, it, it, even though two or three of them make up more than 90% of the market share. So if your vendor has a good understanding of this and understands how users are interacting and understands screen readers and has good procedures around how they're going to implement those, that's a really good sign that your, your vendor has an understanding of accessibility. Um, manual testing is, is, is kind of goes hand in hand with screen readers, but also deals with using the keyboards, using assistive technologies like drag and dictate or zoom text, um, or other pieces of things that help a user uh, interact with the digital asset properly. And then finally, the last question that that's really critical is how, what, what is the commitment for your business? So if you have a team of developers and you're bringing in external experts, are they going to do this for you? Are they going to give you a report that you're going to need to use yourself? Are they going to educate you on this report? I mean, these types of things, I can't tell you how many people, you know, get 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 either end up in a legal action or they hear about this and they want to get preventative. And then what ends up happening is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and then what ends up happening is they get a report, they get an assessment, and then they have no idea what to do with the assessment. And it's because they didn't ask up front, what am I getting and what are you expecting me to do in the end? What's the level of effort I will need to commit to interpret your test results? And there should be, you know, a good process and answer for that for any company that is uh, asking that question. Next slide, please. So um, I like to bring this one up because this is the first time I got to bring my work home. My wife was very interested in knowing why Beyonce.com was sued. Um, Beyonce.com was sued by a person with disabilities who actually is, is suing for, is, is trying to attempt class action status because uh, she could not purchase goods or tickets on the Beyonce.com website. The really interesting thing about Beyonce.com, however, is if you look at many of the free scanning tools that are available on the internet, it actually passes those scans. So you basically had what I referred to before is somebody probably put in their contract a requirement that says you must be accessible, but never told them what it was. And this is Matt guessing right now. I don't know. I, I, I just know that somebody did some work because if you have the accessibility errors that they have and you pass the scans, there's a good chance that you pass the scans on purpose, but you didn't know all of the other requirements that require manual testing, testing with screen readers, testing with keyboard, et cetera, which is where they failed most of the time. So it, it's really important to be educated. It's really important to be committed. And, and most importantly, it's really important to have assistance from experts if this is the first time you're doing this. Um, next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to hand this actually back to Jim Corporal. Thank you, everybody, for your time this afternoon or this morning. How are we in morning or afternoon? Uh, it's a long day. Uh, but anyway, Jim, thank you so much for, for passing it to me. And I uh, pass it over to you with document remediation. Matt, thanks so much for that explanation on web accessibility. A lot of super helpful information there. Um, I just want to remind everybody that the webinar is being uh, recorded and it'll be available uh, in a few weeks. So uh, uh, come on back and, and, and download it to, to make sure that you, you capture all of uh, Matt's information and, and what, we're, what we still have to come. So uh, Matt, again, thanks so much for, for that. Appreciate that. Um, also uh, for our attendees, uh, any questions for Matt? Uh, as we go through the presentation, uh, just feel free to enter them into the, the Q&A tab uh, in your WebEx session, and we'll, we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, I'm now going to take some time to walk um, 
or to talk specifically about document accessibility through remediation. Uh, we'll start with what document accessibility is, how do we do it, and finally, why is it important? I'll provide some examples, give some background on why we need to address it, and share a video clip we made highlighting the importance of making documents accessible. Next slide, please. So quickly, founded in 1952, the Viscardi Center is a network of nonprofit organizations that provides a lifespan of services that educate, employ, and empower children and adults with disabilities. We work with businesses to increase their capacity to hire, retain, and advance individuals with disabilities. We also recently launched a full suite of digital accessibility services. Uh, we aim to be the one-stop shop for our partners and clients in planning and executing on their digital accessibility needs. That's why you're all here uh, listening into our webinar today. Uh, you can learn more about us, of course, at uh, our website, viscardicenter.org. Next slide, please. So what exactly is document remediation? Well, it's a software coding or editing process performed by someone who specializes in accessibility authoring techniques. Uh, basically, we ensure that your digital content is accessible by all of your internal and external viewers, including those with low vision and blindness who utilize assistive technology, such as screen reading software. Uh, a very a very popular program is called JAWS, and it's spelled J-A-W-S, and that stands for Job Access with Speech. Uh, when Adobe PDF files, Microsoft Word documents, Microsoft PowerPoint presentations are made accessible through remediation, paragraph headings are marked, the paragraph structures are set, charts, lists, graphs, and tables are modified and adapted, photos, images, and graphics are descriptively tagged, and forms may be generated with fillable fields so that a screen reader can read the content accurately, efficiently, and in the order in which the author intended it to be. Next slide, please. So what types of materials should be made accessible? Well, there are many. Uh, they include employee handbooks, job applications, new and legacy documents posted on school district websites, company, government, and agency websites, materials and worksheets for students and mortgage applications, just to name a few. Uh, as a rule of thumb, any document that might be used by the public, your customers, employees, or other stakeholders should be made accessible. Next slide, please. So how do we do it? Well, documents are usually created using traditional authoring tools like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. In some cases where no electronic version of a previously created document exists, the document needs to be scanned into a digital file format. These digital files contain something called metadata or tags. These tags identify the elements we spoke about earlier, so the headings, the paragraph structure, charts, lists, and so on. And using proprietary software, we assess the file and modify these tags to adhere to compliance rules, which gets us about 75 to 90% of the way home. We then need to review the document for any photos, images, graphics, and manually insert descriptive text for each so that the screen reading software knows what to read to a viewer when it comes upon that particular image. So that's kind of like a tooltip that we see when we roll over uh, certain parts of uh, either a website page or, or an Adobe document or Microsoft Word document. Um, once we're happy with the descriptive text entries, we then perform a quality check by quote unquote listening to the document using the screen reading software where we confirm all is as it should be, in particular, the reading order is correct, and those figures and images appropriately described. The final step to quality assurance is to check the remediated file for compliance. We do this by using the accessibility checker feature built into Microsoft Word, or in the case of Adobe PDF file, uh, there's a, the Adobe Full Check tool, uh, and then there's a, a free tool called a PDF Accessibility Checker, or PAC for short. Uh, if the checkers report any errors, we go back and find, we correct them, and then retest until the file passes. We then deliver the remediated document back to the owner where they are free to safely publish or distribute it. Next slide, please. So why is digital accessibility important? Well, you heard a lot of reasons uh, from Matt, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more. First, organizations that do not make documents, websites, and videos accessible face exposure to legal risk. 
Second, there is an established business case for accessibility, and those organizations that have prioritized addressing it have reaped the benefits. Again, repeating what Mike, um, excuse me, what Matt mentioned earlier. And lastly, most importantly, organizations that proactively make their digital content environments accessible promote social and economic inclusion and are rewarded through increased credibility for their social responsibility efforts as well. Next slide, please. There are a number of national and international laws that enforce digital accessibility, but the two laws most commonly associated with the flood of recent lawsuits are the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. When drafted, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 mandated that all electronic and information technology used by the federal government be accessible to people with disabilities. Section 508 was intended to cover federal agencies, but it has been widely accepted that colleges and universities as well are subject to its requirements under Title II because they receive federal funding. The United States Access Board recently released uh, an update to 508, which is com commonly known as the ICT refresh, which went into effect on January 18, 2018 of last year. The Americans with Disabilities Act, or EDA, is the law most widely associated with digital accessibility for private sector companies. Title III of the ADA, which guarantees non-discrimination for people with disabilities in public accommodations, was the basis of over 2,000 digital accessibility lawsuits in 2018, more than ever before. With major historical settlements and decisions piling up against, again, Target, Bank of America, Winn-Dixie, uh, and most recently, Domino's, it's becoming imperative for all organizations to push accessibility. So again, we're driving home the, the point here that uh, not only for your websites, but for your electronic documents, uh, these same uh, laws and acts uh, apply. Next slide, please. Again, there's a strong business case for accessibility. As Matt shared earlier, over 57 million Americans have some form of disability, and that number is growing, ra growing rapidly as boomers age into retirement and age-related disabilities. In the marketplace, accessible digital files ensure current and prospective customers have access to all products and services materials. Various surveys have shown the low vision population is growing with over 21 million adults with non-correctable vision loss from a marketing revenue perspective alone, that number is quite formidable. Just think how nice it would be to suddenly have access to 21 more potential customers than you do today. Next slide, please. And lastly, there is a, a tangible social return on investment for accessibility and organizations that promote it are rewarded in kind. Uh, accessible digital materials in the workplace boost employee productivity for those with and without disclosed disabilities and plays a role in the hiring, retention, and advancement of individuals with disabilities. In a school set setting, for instance, it allows children with visual and physical disabilities to fully engage in the classroom and work more in, uh, independently. Accessibility supports social inclusion for people with disabilities as well as the aging population, those living in rural areas, and people in developing countries. Accessibility with respect to documents also benefits people without disabilities by providing a more enjoyable end user experience. The documents are much more easier to navigate, they are more descriptive, and they keep the viewer engaged. Now before moving on to the final presenter, we're going to show you a video that we shot of a real client document before and after going through our remediation process to highlight the experience of a user who is blind attempting to read an inaccessible document. Can we please show the video?
So as we can see from the clip, I think it's quite obvious how frustrating it is to a person who relies on assistive technology to navigate their digital content. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand it off uh, to Jeff Andrews, who will talk to us about accessibility in video and audio content. Uh, Jeff, you have the floor. Thanks for the introduction uh, there, Jim. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of background on ACS and a bit of uh, background on myself as well. ACS was started over 10 years ago uh, with a mission to provide the highest quality voice to text and sign language services possible to consumers throughout the whole world. We work with clients ranging from government agencies, Fortune 100 companies, colleges and universities, uh, school systems, large conferences, and we've even provided captioning for import, important moments in, in people's lives like weddings. I personally have been in accessibility for several years uh, in both sales and marketing roles, and I really enjoy working with students. I always try and put myself in their shoes, trying to get the same grades as my peers, but without having equal access to coursework or other materials. Part of my job is oftentimes advocating on behalf of a student or even their parent for the services that they deserve. And that's always something that I'm happy to do for them. So as part of my presentation, I'm going to give a really high level overview of a few of the services that we offer at ACS. Uh, this will encompass the list that I have on the screen, he screen here and will go in order of CART, post-production captioning, and audio description. We will address what these are, their applications, related accessibility standards, and why they should be offered from various legal and business perspectives. And I'll try and point out a few interesting facts or statistics along the way. Next slide, please. So first, let's go ahead and discuss CART, which uh, ACS is providing on today's webinar. CART stands for Communication Access Real-Time translation. It's a service that is used by deaf and hard of hearing consumers and is the verbatim translation of the spoken word into text in real time. And it can be offered both on-site or remotely. On-site is, is fairly straightforward with the captioner going on location to provide services. So today let's focus on remote. Here's how it works. And we'll go ahead and use today's setup as an example. Our captioner listens to the event from his or her home office through an audio source provided by the client. Uh, today, we're lucky enough to have Brooke captioning for us, and she is listening in via the same you know, WebEx link that we all got. The audio source could also be a traditional phone line, a voice over internet audio like Skype, for example, or can come directly from a soundboard uh, sorry, a sound engineer's soundboard. The delay from the time the presenter speaks to the time our captions appear on the screen is generally two to three seconds, and they are over 98% accurate, with captioners being able to type at well over 200 words per minute. Some remote platforms, including WebEx, Adobe Connect, and Zoom, let us caption directly to a dedicated caption window within the platform, just like we're doing today. If you use a different platform, we can simply provide a link to our captioning platform called StreamText. The text can then be accessed on a smartphone, tablet, laptop, or even displayed on a large screen for an entire audience to view. The captions can also be included on live streams, like Facebook Live. Streaming events online as you probably know, has become you know, more and more commonplace over the years. And it can be a safe bet to assume that if you stream an event to the public or even any large group of people, uh, there will be a percentage of the audience who is deaf or hard of hearing. In order to provide them with equal access, uh, CART can certainly be made available. In fact, the ADA requires that Title II entities, which include state and local governments, and Title III entities, which includes businesses and nonprofit organizations that serve the public, communicate effectively with people who have communication disabilities. 
For individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing, CART or sign language interpretation can be offered. And captions are also a WCAG 2.0 AA requirement for live synchronized media. Um, so on the screen here, um, I already referenced that captioners can type at over uh, an, an accuracy rate of over 98%. And the image that we have on the screen is one of our actual cap captioners uh, live at, I believe, a conference um, providing uh, captioning to an audience member to her side. Um, and what she is using to be able to type so quickly uh, is a steno machine. Uh, and that's allowing her to type at over 200 words per minute. Next slide, please. So post-production captioning requires the same level of detail as CART captioning. However, these captions, which are text versions of the spoken word presented within the media, are created in post. Because of this, they should be even more accurate, uh, closer to even 99% or higher if they're done correctly. And according to WHO, or the World Health Organization, 20% of Americans are deaf or have hearing loss. So there is certainly a large uh, percentage of the population who benefit from captions. Section 508 requires captioning and transcription of any video content made public by federal agencies or organizations receiving federal funds, and that includes higher education institutions as well. In Title II and III, of the ADA prohibit the discrimination by both government agencies and by places of public accommodation. Currently, the main reason why organizations um, are providing captioning is probably legal compliance. And with less than half of organizations captioning all of their videos, you can imagine that there is a steady stream of lawsuits and they're brought by both the consumers as well as advocacy groups. Unfortunately, most organizations' policies for captioning are a pretty reactionary process. For example, if a bank gets a complaint that an individual video on their website is not captioned, they will most likely go ahead and make the combination. However, obviously, that requires that the consumer has to wait before the video is made available to them, which is very unfortunate. Uh, besides avoiding costly and complicated lawsuits, there are some other benefits of having all of your video content captioned. Now, this includes better search engine optimization, or SEO, increased interaction, and generally the viewers just comprehend the material better. Um, this is extremely uh, important as well in educational settings. Um, the captions help all students better co comprehend the content especially those who are not native English speakers. And these same principles really ring true to the business community as well. And for businesses trying to reach consumers through the use of social media, captions can be extremely helpful. I'm sure we've all been uh, scrolling on Facebook or Instagram through an endless stream of video content. And you have probably noticed that the videos default to playing with no sound. Uh, but videos with captions get far more interaction, uh, and they really do stand out from the crowd. Captions should meet certain criteria, uh, which are set by WCAG, as well as the Described and Captions Media Program. Uh, not all captions are created equally, and generally speaking, if something is free, it's probably too good to be true. According to WCAG, captions should be synchronized, equivalent and accessible, meaning the text content appears at the same time as the audio. The content in the captions should be as close to possible to the verbatim spoken word, and the captions should be made easily available to everyone. Some organizations do choose to use free automated speech recognition generated captions, or ASR, to create their captions. But at this point in time, ASR really struggles with things like accents, grammar, and difficult vocabulary. Uh, ASR may have results which are as high as 95% accurate, which, which really does sound great. 
uh, but that could result in the content of the video being unintelligible or even worse, conveying the wrong meaning. Um, I'm sure you've all probably seen some bad captions uh, in your lifetime, but I have included a link in the slide to an interesting video made by some funny uh, YouTubers who tested YouTube's ASR. They basically play a game of telephone, uh, each time creating a video with dialogue based on the ASR-generated script, which gets worse and worse each time it's read. Um, so if you have some time, I recommend you know clicking on the link and checking it out. Uh, at ACS, we really recommend that captions uh, be created by human beings, and we have a pretty simple process. Uh, human transcription, human alignment, and human quality control. Uh, you will notice the image on the screen of the closed captioning icon. We're probably all familiar with that. Uh, there are two types of post-production captions. Uh, closed captions, which can either be turned on or off, and open captions, which are burned into the video. Uh, that means that the captions are always there, and thus they are always accessible. Uh, for that reason, uh, we really recommend using open captions. Let's go ahead and take a look at a clip with some high quality captions. Um, if we could please just play the video. So the captions there were uh, extremely accurate. They accounted for the background noise, such as the applause, uh, and they were able to deal with the actor's fake accent. Next slide, please. Unlike the previous two accommodations we discussed, audio description helps to make video content accessible to blind and low vision individuals by providing an alternative format for the visual content of the video. It can sometimes be helpful to think of audio description as captioning for the visually impaired. And like captioning, it is a requirement under the ADA. While captioning is, in a, is objective in providing verbatim transcription, audio description is much more subjective because the describer must determine what content is relevant and cannot simply be understood by the audio alone. Therefore, it is very important that the describer actually understands the content. Audio description is also an important part of making video content uh, WCAG 2.0 AA and AAA compliant. And while captioning is fairly commonplace, audio description is far less prevalent, and that's primarily due to the cost that are associated, as well as the challenging process it takes to create. However, recently the costs have started to come down and we're seeing an increase of organizations that are actually adhering to the WCAG standards. Just like captioning, audio description doesn't just benefit its intended users. All students can benefit. Um, take for example, if you have something like complicated graphs or charts, Having audio description makes it so much easier for all of the students to understand those visual aids. And I've got some good news. Uh, not all videos need to be described if we create them with accessibility in mind. If the speaker takes the time to describe all the relevant visual content, then the video alone will be enough. And there are two types of audio description, traditional and extended. Traditional audio description uh, squeezes the captions in between breaks in the dialogue. Therefore, it doesn't change the runtime. However, it allows for only limited descriptions. This would be used, for example, a movie playing in a theater where the runtime couldn't be altered. With extended, playback of the video is paused for the descriptions to be read. 
Therefore, there is no need to fit them into the tiny spaces, which can oftentimes be a really expensive and difficult process. However, it does alter the runtime, but it does create a far more understandable video. Extended makes the most sense, uh, especially in educational settings, and regular audio, audio description doesn't meet the effective accommodation standard that's set under DOJ policy. Um, so on the screen here, we just have uh, the audio description icon. Um, you know, most people probably don't even recognize what it is, um, but uh, there are over 500 titles available on Netflix, um, probably as a result of, of the lawsuit that they were hit with. Um, and I recommend that you know folks check those titles out. Um, apparently, millennials are using them as, as audiobooks, so that's pretty cool. Um, and that's it for me, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Jim. Okay, Jeff, thanks so much for, for that, that introduction on, um, on captioning services. We appreciate that. Um, I'm looking at time here. It's uh, 1.55, so we have a few minutes. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to try to take some questions from from uh, the audience. Uh, I'm going to just scroll through a few here. Uh, it looks like we have one for Matt. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, Matt, we do not have the resources at this time to build a new website. Is there anything uh, we can do now to make our current site accessible? I'll let Matt take that. Absolutely. It's a great question. So the first question uh, will, the, the, the first answer is it depends on how your website is built. If you're using a content management system like WordPress or Drupal, there's a lot you can do um, as is just to kind of tag your images with alt text and, and potentially move to new themes. Um, if you can't even do that or, or you're looking for more of a managed automation platform, uh, User First You Remediate is, is a great example of a couple of automation platforms out there which lets you make your website accessible without changing the underlying code. So it, it really depends on a couple of questions we would want to kind of qualify through, but the answer is there's a lot you can do without building a new website and we almost never recommend to wait for a new website to be built. Um, there was actually a really interesting lawsuit with Hooters where Hooters made the claim that, well, we've already made a settlement with somebody else and we're building a new website, so therefore we should dismiss this other claim. And the judge basically said, no, you can't. Just because you promised to do something in the future doesn't negate your responsibilities today. So that question is, is very appropriate and, and there is a lot you can do. Great. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, going to go quick here. We have a few more minutes. Uh, here's one for Jeff. Jeff, is there any difference from having someone on site or off site providing the captioning? So Jeff, I'll let you take that. Uh, yeah, it, it kind of just depends on the setup. So I would probably say that 95% of the services that we offer are done remotely, um, which uh, I guess it can be a little bit more challenging. However, because of modern technology, it, it's fairly simple. So when we do something remotely, we basically need to figure out uh, two things. We need to figure out how we're getting the audio from the client, um, which if it's being done remotely is probably something like uh, Skype or a phone line. And then we need to figure out how they're going to be viewing those captions. So they're probably going to be using a link to StreamText, which is our captioning, captioning platform, um, unless they use something like uh, Adobe, Zoom, WebEx. Um, those things are a little bit more straightforward uh, when they're done on site, just because the, the captioner is most likely going to be just listening you know, live to the actual event um, and then displaying the captions on a screen for either an individual consumer that's sitting next to them or the captions will be displayed on a large screen, uh, for example, if we're at a conference. Um, so yeah, there are, there are some differences and we always just work with our clients to figure out those you know, well, well ahead of time. 
Okay, thank you, Jeff. We appreciate that. Uh, we are running towards the end of our allotted time here, so uh, I'm going to uh, move us on, but thank you for those questions, and uh, we'll try to get to them um, uh, uh, after uh, the, uh, the webinar is completed. We'll try to see if we can get you uh, those some responses to those questions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, as we said, uh, one last item. We just want to give you this polling question um, again, see if we've uh, been able to help you with your understanding of um, digital accessibility. So please uh, complete the polling question that you should see in your, uh, in your windows. One to five being the scale, one very little understanding, and five uh, a better understanding or extensive understanding. We have a few seconds for that. Again, this helps us to create future webinars based on um, demand and, and your knowledge. And we're just about ready to tally those results. Okay, so we, we did increase your, your knowledge of digital accessibility, so, so that's good news. I, I think we were successful in our webinar. We, we, we did our job today, so, so thank you for completing um, that, that survey. Um, next slide, please. Lastly, here's my contact information. Um, it's been our pleasure to present this webinar to you today. Uh, I think we've had an excellent discussion, and I know we barely scratched the surface on this very important topic. Matt and Jeff, uh, you were amazing. Thanks so much for all of uh, the information you presented. We appreciate you taking the time out today uh, to share that knowledge. And, and finally, uh, a great thank you to our, our attendees today um, for joining us. We hope you enjoyed uh, our, uh, our session today. And again, please complete. Uh, there'll be a brief survey uh, as you exit the webinar um, for uh, give us an idea for future webinars, what we can uh, develop. Uh, as well as um, help us with our blogging uh, uh, activities. So, again, thanks so much for joining us today, and have a wonderful day, and thank you again.